Hey, C Squared here. In this video, I'm going to be talking to my good friend Gary Wilkins. Gary is a fantastic bass player that I've known for a couple of decades now uh, here on the Atlanta music scene. And uh, not only did we teach together for many years at uh, the Atlanta Institute of Music, but he also played on uh, three tracks of my original CD, Amplitude. Um, so today is going to be fun. I'm going to sit down and talk to Gary for a while and hear about uh, his background and, uh, and his career at this, uh, up to this point. And I think it'll be really interesting and we can learn a lot from uh, all of Gary's experiences and anecdotes. So let's, uh, let's check it out. Welcome, Gary. And uh, uh, first thing is I, I do want to just hear about uh, how you got into, uh, into music, how you got started, uh, your first instruments that you learned on, and, uh, and how did all that come about, and where are you from? Right. Um, I'm from uh, Teaneck, New Jersey, and um, actually I got into music through, basically through, ultimately through my parents. Mm -hmm. um, actually, I just found out last year at my parents' uh, 65th wedding anniversary <laughs> that uh, a couple of my grandparents actually played organ, wow. like in church, which I didn't, I never knew that. I thought that was really interesting That's to find cool. out at this point, you know, <laughs> nice. in my career that that was actually reality because I do play, uh, I've, since I've been in Georgia, I, I have played at a few churches, you mm -hmm. know, so it's really interesting. Um, my parents played not professionally, but my father played a little bit of guitar, you know, when I was a kid. And um, so my mother, she played piano. My father also played piano. And um, again, not professionally, but just in the house, so I always heard music. Mm -hmm. um, I have two older brothers, and uh, one took drum lessons. I don't remember that because I probably was too young. Right. He took drum lessons, never you know, fully um, continued with that. Mm -hmm. And my other brother was a guitar player, and they were both forced to play piano right. when, they were, when they were young. Right. You know? And um, by the time you know, I, was, I was listening to music and everything, um, I was... I was always attracted to the drums. My brother's mm -hmm. um, band used to rehearse like in the basement, you right. know, and I used to always be attracted to drums. But uh, for some bizarre reason, <laughs> I ended up playing accordion when I was 10. <laughs> right. So someone just shows up at the door and says, oh, somebody recommended you yada, 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 right, right. you know, to play accordion. So I was like, well, you know, I always heard music, you know, in the family and stuff. So I said, well, Sure, I'll try. It was like a 12 week period right. that you would, you know, trial period that you would play to see if you liked the instrument. Right. And then you would actually have to commit to it. Right. Um, for three years. It was group lessons and um, you part of it was paying for the instrument for three years. That's mm -hmm. why you had to commit for three years. Right. So I did play accordion for three years. After I got to about <laughs> two years, I didn't want to play anymore. It's like you joined the accordion <laughs> convent. <laughs> right. Right. So uh, my mother would have me playing at teas, like in at church they would have these little tea, you know, these little mm -hmm. performances where uh, you know, so she would ask me to play, so I would play. So by the time um, I turned 14, I was, uh, I had gotten a bass, mm -hmm. you know. So with accordion, I have a, there's 120 buttons mm -hmm. on the left-hand side right. and, you know, keyboard on the right-hand side. So I was getting calluses from playing bass. <laughs> so there's a rhinestone that's C, and then everything goes up like in fourths. Uh -huh. So C, F, B flat, E flat, and down, mm -hmm. you know, fifths, whatever. And um, so... I uh, I couldn't feel the rhinestone, so I couldn't tell where C was because you can't see it because the instrument, you know, is like right, right. here. You can't see it, so it's a whole feel thing. So I'm I can't feel the rhinestone because I have these calluses. So I told my mother, I said, look, you know, you have to stop committing me because I can't play this instrument because I don't know what my left hand actually is. Wow. So um, like I said, so when I was 14, I got a bass, and even though I could read music from playing accordion mm -hmm. um, at the age of 10, I um, I played by ear. Mm -hmm. for a couple of years until I was 16. Right. And um, around that time, I decided that I wanted to, you know, further, go further with it and right. actually, you know, go to college with it and stuff. Nice. Um, so, um, I actually studied, continued to study with my accordion teacher. Oh, really? Wow. Um, yeah, yeah, husband and wife, again, in Teaneck, New Jersey. And um, so... Basically, I wasn't learning technique from them. Mm -hmm. I was kind of, you know, learning music. before I went to college, I was formally self-taught the whole technique thing. I was <laughs> <Right>. just <laughs> just from watching people play and, right. and listening to records and stuff. And um, but they were basically teaching me further stuff as far as theory, right. notation, right. And, you know, how to count right. beyond just eighth notes. Right. You know, at that point. So um, so that that actually was a good thing. It would prepare me for college, but. Uh, 
going back a little bit as far as stuff that I listened to mm-hmm. um, when I got my bass. My brother, the first song I ever learned was uh, Sly and the Sto- Family Stone, mm-hmm. uh, Family Affair, oh, which cool. is doop, 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 doop. I think the note was A. <laughs> I, didn't, I might not have sung an A, but, but the note was A. So my brother was showing me that, you know. And um, so the, the thing that was really neat is that my brother, since he was a guitar player, he was bringing in different kind of music into the house. Mm-hmm. So at an early age, when I was like 16, 17, he's bringing in Chick Corea, Herbie Hancock. Right. Um, you know, all Al Di Miola, all this, all this different like fusion stuff mm-hmm. that actually back then was being played on. We're, we're talking like you know seventies, like mid seventies. Right. Um, in New York, there was a radio station that played that stuff on the radio. That's so, right. so it was really cool to be able to, you know, hear that stuff being played on the radio. Then my brother bringing the records in, so I got exposed to the whole uh, jazz fusion thing really right. at a young age. While nice. while other players in the neighborhood were listening to, you know, Brothers Johnson, you mm-hmm. know, uh, Earth, Wind, and Fire, which I mean, I listened to some of that stuff too. But I was really attracted to the uh, the guys who I was considering the cutting edge right guys at that time right you know right. which was a real uh real neat thing and yeah. uh so like i said so by the time i had um oh when i was in this is a good thing to i guess mention <laughs> <laughs> when i was in high school the word kind of got out that i could read uh-huh. you know because back then there wasn't a lot of people who were reading right. especially bass players right and um so i was asked to play in the uh, concert band mm-hmm. in high school and also the jazz band oh, cool. so i played um i still probably can't play it today but west side story because some of right. those lines in, in west right. side story are pretty involved right but right. reading stuff like west side story uh mm-hmm. guys and dolls all these musicals which right. i which i really actually liked the idea of hearing French horn, bassoon, right. and oboe mm-hmm. and all this stuff. I was like, man, this is cool because right. when I was like 14, 15, I played with a couple of friends locally and we were just playing guitar, bass, and drums. Right. You know, so for me to hear all these other instruments and saw how my part fit right. with what was going on was a really neat thing. And that's where yeah. I thought my career was going to go. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> I thought I was going to end up playing in the pit. That was right, that was that right. was kind of my thing. Right. You know? <laughs> you know, I said, man, this is great. So just playing a set part was mm-hmm. was really attractive. I wasn't into the whole like improv thing, which came later on. Right. Af- wow. After I went to school. Yeah, I wouldn't have guessed that about you, really. Yeah. I okay. Mean, because I just I know you as such a great improviser. That's okay. really uh, interesting. Yeah. Um, but the thing that I think is a really good point in all that is how being able to read music actually gave you a lot of extra opportunity. Right. Um, a lot of young musicians miss out on, you know, I mean, I'm always telling people that there's, there's so many things that, that you could, you could do with reading music besides, you know, looking like a nerdy guy reading music, you know, I mean, it's, (laughs) it opens up this whole world. Right. And that's just a great example of that, how that opened up, so much for you early that was not available to other people your your peer group right yeah right no doubt so i did end up uh, to further my studies i ended up going to uh william patterson college mm-hmm. which i think now is called william patterson university okay and they had a great <clears throat> jazz program and one of the ways that i got introduced to that school is because when i was in high school one of the jazz groups came from william patterson mm-hmm. and they played you know assembly program they played and I was like, man, that's cool. That's great. You know, and the bass right. player, actually, I think I still remember his name to this day, uh, Bob Harrison, mm-hmm. who was playing bass, who was just killing. You right. know? And I was like, wow, yeah. I, I, this is where I need to go. You know, <laughs> cool. <laughs> I need to go and study there. So I went to William Patterson uh, College and I was a jazz performance major. And when I started out, uh, Thad Jones and Mel Lewis were head of the music department. Mm-hmm. And then later on, my last year or so, uh, Rufus Reed came in oh, wow. and took over the department. Nice. And uh, so I learned a lot there as far as, you know, typical stuff, uh, improv classes, mm-hmm. uh, reading, um, just, you know, mm-hmm. t- typical stuff um, to, you know, getting a degree. And that, you know, I, I'm, I'm kind of thinking a little cir- uh, circuitous here, but but the thing about uh, you having the the that role going back to your role with uh 
set parts and and things like that that actually does clue me into uh to the fact that you were always really adamant with the students uh when you and i taught together at at the music school that you were real adamant with the students who were responsible for playing the melody to know the melody right and and i think that's that's really cool how that had that on your radar so much and i think the students were always kind of surprised that the bass teacher was saying <laughs> dude you gotta learn the melody <laughs> you know? but that's awesome that's that's really cool and uh, that's another great uh you know well-rounded example of musicianship that you get from that situation so so right. not to take you off of where right. you were but just that that just occurred to me that that right. you know that made me think oh yeah that's that's probably how gary really got dialed into the the melodies at an, an early age right yeah you know i was I also would uh you know back then especially um jocko is one of my biggest influences mm-hmm. um I could I could I could list you know a ton of cats. I mean, it probably right. started out from, and I can't even remember who the bass player was from uh, Shaka Khan's band, mm-hmm. Shaka Khan, you know, mm-hmm. and uh, but um, started from him again. These from records that my brother was bringing into the house. Uh, you know, Larry Graham. I got right. turned on to Larry Graham. You know, and all of this stuff again was when I was like 15, 16, 17 years old. Right. And then uh, Stanley Clark right. through Return to Fever because my brother brought that stuff in. So I was like, wow. Check out what Stanley Clark is doing, and yeah, then, absolutely. then I think I was in high school when like School Days came out. Mm-hmm. You know, trying to learn all of that stuff, right. and then getting turned on to Jocko and the whole bit. So as far as continuing, you know, my knowledge when Jocko came out with his instructional video, mm-hmm. his first instructional video, um, there's a point in the video where he's talking about, you know, really you need to learn the melodies, mm-hmm. you know. So that was. That kind of stuck with me, you know, right? And right. Uh, it's just really good as far as keeping the form, right. you know, of, of things. Also, going back to the reading thing, when mm-hmm. I was in college, I was asked by some musicians to play like in a big band, you know, and they would have like a Monday night kind of rehearsal right. thing, where some of that stuff were were like older guys who, you know, probably had other careers, but they got instead of going bowling, they got <laughs> together on a Monday night to play through some jazz charts, whether it was, you know, Duke Ellington's mm-hmm. stuff, uh, Count Basie, that kind of stuff. So right. with me being able to read, mm-hmm. again, I was asked to do that and I could go. And that was kind of a continuation from when I did play bass in jazz band and right. I was reading, you know, walking bass lines, note for note. Thing interesting about that, a lot of times those charts had no chord changes. <laughs> right. So you had to read every note because if you if you were lost, you were definitely mm. lost. It wasn't like <laughs> I could jump back in at like C7. Mm-hmm. You know, you were right. you were just kind of out there. Right. So uh, that was also a great opportunity to be able to just read charts like that, a good experience. Right. Nice. And um, also, I um, during the time I was in college, I had gotten asked to do um, just jam sessions, like mm-hmm. a jazz jam session. So I would go, I had back then I had bought a real book. You right. Know? And um, so I would go do this jam session. It wasn't paying next to no money, but. Was it hard to get a real book back then? Or did you have to know somebody? <laughs> it was, a, <clears throat> excuse me, it was the same same deal where it's like you had to walk into the store and say, hey man, you got the real book. <laughs> <laughs> I, I had that. that I'm, I'm glad you know, I had that right, experience too. Right, that right. Was, so that it was, was, it was not. A, it was not an easy thing to necessarily get a real book. Made but you feel special. But right. <laughs> <laughs> but you definitely had to know who to ask. You know. Right. You know, ask somebody. Hey, how did you get your real book? And right. they would, they would give you the scoop. Right. You I know? don't want to blow anybody's cover, but Bill Hart <laughs> was the one who, okay. who who told me who to ask. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, so I would I would bring my real book to like these jam sessions and there might it might be, you know, like six horn players who would come in, you know, mm-hmm. whether it's trumpet, sax, trombone, whatever. And <clears throat> we'd play maybe something like Autumn Leaves. Mm-hmm. Right? So I'd open up the real book and and read the tune mm-hmm. down. And uh again, this was just a little bit after I was out of college. Right. And uh so the deal was you have to think if there's six horn players and they each play about seven choruses soloing you know seven times through the song soloing right. after a while i knew the song uh, i didn't i didn't right. even have to read the changes i knew it after playing the same song for like 20 minutes i was good to go right. <laughs> you know so, so that was that was a real interesting thing but um i'll kind of go back a little bit and talk about some of the first gigs 
that I actually did. Mm -hmm. And um, I actually started out, my first professional gig was when I was 17. And um, it was basically what we would call now like classic rock. Right. You know, right. 50 ways to leave your lover. I sure. like to think of it as 50 ways to love your lever, but that's, that's something <laughs> different. Maybe that's, maybe, that's, maybe that's not the PG version of right. um, yeah, right. the title, whatever. <laughs> we used to play classic rock stuff. And um, I played in this place. Uh, in the town next to me, which was mm. Bergenfield, actually, mm. that's where Al Di Miola's from. Oh, okay. And uh, we played in this Italian restaurant. They served alcohol. Mm -hmm. I didn't drink, still don't. But I was underage to be in there, but they knew I wasn't. I wasn't going to drink, so it was right. okay. So um, did that gig, and then a lot of my other gigs uh, started from being in college, being mm. asked to play. You know, people say, "Oh man, you play bass." You know, um, real good friend of mine uh, up in New Jersey, Ed Decker. Um, that I was in college with, he asked me to play in 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 a band with him, mm -hmm. and uh, just a, that band taught out of his music store. So I started teaching, mm -hmm. actually, probably only about maybe three years after I started playing. I started teaching. Right. That goes back to my accordion teacher. It's like, oh, I have this bass student. Can you come in and teach it? I'm like, uh, <laughs> yeah, I guess so. I mean, right. I had never taught before. Right. You know, so that's so again, I've been teaching for for a very long time. Right. And um, but with some of the other uh, gigs and opportunities that I've done through the years, um, I had situations where I've played in bands. Um, this was like early 80s, um, mm -hmm. was a band from Toronto and played with them. And that gig was like six nights a week playing right. anywhere from Niagara <clears throat> Falls to uh, to uh, Arkansas. And that was you know? like a classic. And that or, or, that, that pretty that pretty much or... since that was early '80s that was pretty much uh pretty much dance kind of stuff. Like, yeah, I mean we just we did some print or... stuff, and I also right. had to sing in that band. Oh yeah, yeah. Wow. So I was okay. singing lead on about eight songs, cool. and then background, you know. So that what, was what material were you singing? We um we did Prince, Less Work. Yeah, we did uh Let It Whip, not Devo, <laughs> not Whip It, <laughs> right. but Let It Whip. Um, so one Elvis song, I had to sing all of this, I had to sing all of the stuff that this other bass player used to sing because mm -hmm. I was I was coming in I, I caught up with the band. Uh, so you I was, just inherited the role. right all all of his parts and all of his harmony parts, wow. which was a challenge because some of that stuff yeah. you know I would naturally hear maybe the thirds mm -hmm. of, of the chord you know, and uh, so it was a challenge to hear you know I was sitting in a hotel room, <laughs> have to tell this story because um, I always tell the students this story. And anytime somebody says they work hard, uh -huh. I'm thinking like, okay, I wonder if it's as hard as I felt that I worked <laughs> because right. I had to get with, I got with this band <clears throat> and I was, again, I was coming in, subbing, you know, taking the mm -hmm. bass player had left. So I auditioned for the band and ended, ended up getting the gig. So I sat in a hotel room from, I guess, Monday through Friday, maybe Saturday, mm. right outside of Nashville. And I had to learn about 30 songs. Wow. Bass lines, lyrics, you know, for, yeah. for, for the, uh, the songs I was singing, and mm -hmm. even background lyrics, uh, you know, right. vocals I was doing um, for most of the other songs. Right. Because right. as I'm practicing all of this music, and this was not like, a, you know, a jazz thing, you can kind of, we talked about the real book, mm -hmm. you can kind of get the real book out there mm -hmm. and you can just, right. you have a guide. Um, I had to, commit all of this stuff to memory. Plus there was no, uh, you couldn't look it up on Google and find all those parts separated out and it, someone it, showing exactly, you how to do it. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Back then, we're talking, you know, 82, 83. Mm -hmm. We're not even talking, we're yeah. not even really yeah. talking CDs, are we? I mean, <laughs> not, not, not for most people. Yeah. <laughs> right, definitely not for me. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, yep, had a little, uh, you know, cassette player and, and yeah. hit the pause button mm -hmm. and try to get every note Absolutely, that, yeah. that I had to play. And um, I broke a lot of pause buttons on <laughs> players back then yeah absolutely so one thing that uh that i that i'm noticing in your story is that there's a lot of dimensions to it and there's a lot of different kinds of music and there's a lot of different kinds of experiences and that's something that that uh that i always try to encourage uh young musicians to not say no to too many things at first i mean it's fine once you kind of know your lane if you want to really specialize but but you kind of don't know that until you have some experiences, and I feel like uh, I feel like your your career, your especially those early years, really is a it, it exemplifies that 
that idea because for instance like playing with all those the horn players improvising so much and and in that process not only were you learning the song and really getting it ingrained in you but you also were probably picking up but uh, do you think you were picking up a lot of uh of improvisational ideas just by being exposed to that much improvising right yeah. I'm sure I was, even if it was subconscious. Yeah. You and know? whether it was good or not. <laughs> <laughs> some of it was probably good, some of, but, it, but it's all valuable. Right. Yeah. Right. I, I'm, I'm sure um, listening to that, that music, you know, I wasn't, a, I wasn't a big jazz fan, even mm -hmm. like I tell the students, you know, um, even when I was in college as a jazz performance major for probably my first year and a half, right. I, I wasn't into playing jazz. Right. And part of that was because I was I was into the, like jazz fusion, but not like, you know, like, not like walking baseline swing mm -hmm. jazz or bebop. Right. That really kind of that wasn't where I was at. You right. Know? And um, but um, I did listen to a lot of different music. I, th there, there was one thing that um, I remember my mother uh, kind of saying to me, you know, she just, um, as far as me, you know, she really wanted me to get the whole degree thing, mm. you know, and I was really just like, it's just about playing, right? you know, and, uh, some, I know some of the students, uh, that I was in college with, they were just hardcore, like jazz snobs, mm. you know, I mean, they, they just kind of like, they were all about jazz. They didn't want to hear anything about funk, nothing right, else, right. you know? And I was never that way. I was like, so by the time I came out of college, I said, you know what? I just want a career playing music. Right. And again, I said, I don't care if it's a polka. That's going back. As I digress <laughs> to the back. accordion. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. I don't care if it's a polka. If the musicians are good, mm -hmm. then I'm about the music. Right. So that's, that's probably part of, um, that's a huge part of my playing, even mm -hmm. if people can't hear that. Yeah. Um, the, the band that I mentioned where I was singing and everything, mm -hmm. we played Rocky Top. Right, right. <laughs> okay, so we played everything from Rocky Top to uh, some people might remember Tom Scott, who was a saxophone player. Oh. You know, so we played everything from uh, country to jazz, and that's basically what I what I still Amazing. do now. It, 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 one of the uh, gigs that I do in Atlanta. Yeah, it's, very cool. It's just and uh, it's great. You have you have to. I mean, it's just an expression, right? I mean, yeah. music is basically just mm -hmm. an expression. And uh, to only be sad all day is probably not the best <laughs> thing <laughs> to do. Right. You need you need some kind of balance, right, you know. Right. And that's the same thing with music. Um, I tell the students again at the Atlanta Institute of Music and Media that. Um, it just spills into your pot of musicianship. No mm -hmm. matter what you decide to do musically, mm -hmm. it's, it all goes in the same place. You right. know? It just it makes you a better player. I think it makes you yeah. a better player the more diverse um, you are. You know. Yeah, I, I agree a hundred percent. That's uh, and it's. It, I think when you're young, sometimes you you have such an idealism about what you want to be. Most most young musicians, there's some specific emotional maybe emotional uh, uh pull into it that that makes them want to kind of put up barriers and and identify a certain way right but but really uh you discover so much more uh fulfillment in music i think if you have that variety of experiences and then you can always you know mark off the boundaries later you know right but give yourself a chance yeah when when um when i was in college actually <clears throat> I played in about four different bands mm -hmm. during the time when I was supposed to be doing, you know, schoolwork and all of that right. stuff. And I played in a jazz group, which was more like, you know, swing, walking, mm -hmm. bass lines, that kind of thing. I played in an original rock band, mm -hmm. a three-piece rock band, kind of like, you know, the, what the police would do around the time, right. what the police were mm -hmm. doing, uh, that kind of stuff. And so just, it was a great thing because every time I went to play with different musicians, I was doing like a different thing. Mm -hmm. So I really enjoyed doing yeah. that, that whole thing. Right. It wasn't... Like I felt like I had to anything. It was what I wanted to do. Right. What I what right. I like to do. Kept things fresh you too. Know? I'm sure. Ab absolutely. Right. And you bring a little bit of everything into whatever style right, you're, you're, right. you're playing. You know? Yeah. You make it make something new out of any specialized area because you've got so many influences. Right. Yeah. Um, I'd have to say that that was for me a great thing was listening to a ton of fusion music mm -hmm. when I was young too because. Even though, as far as the Latin music was concerned, I didn't really, when I was younger, I didn't play like a lot of that. 
but some of the weather report stuff I got that sense of what that vibe was. Mm -hmm. So when I did have to play some of the, when I got exposed to more of the Latin stuff, it wasn't so far away from some of the stuff that I had listened to right. growing up. Right. And that's that's probably uh that's that's why I actually if I had to pick a music, it would definitely be like the fusion stuff. You right. Know? Right. Um, but you know how it's a lot of times about paying the bills. So <laughs> So, right. so I need, need to take care of that first. So, so, um, so speaking of the bills, uh, so what, what kind of gigs were leading up to, uh, uh, through those, those, uh, those next years in New Jersey and around New Jersey and then, then, uh, and, uh, or anywhere up in that area and then eventually deciding to move to Atlanta. Right. So some of the gigs that I started doing, um, years ago was, um, Naughty by Nature. Some people have heard of Naughty by Nature. They were a rap group, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. uh, back around mm -hmm. the early 90s, right. you know. And um, my, actually, how I got called to do that was, was a friend of mine that I was in college with. So mm -hmm. again, college was, I wasn't thinking about it. It was a good networking kind of thing. Right. Even right. though back then I wasn't thinking about networking. I was thinking about just doing what I enjoyed to do right, and hanging right. out with people I enjoyed hanging out right, with, right. you know. And... Um, so a friend of mine, uh, Dave Bellocchio, had, mm -hmm. had called me up and asked me to do it. And since I was older at the, mm -hmm. at the time, I didn't really know who Naughty by Nature was. And this, right. was, this was back when MTV actually had music on it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and I called my sister up. She's seven years younger. And, and uh, she says, oh, yeah, that, that band is always on MTV. Mm -hmm. And I turned the television on right then, and the video was on then. <laughs> and I was like, oh, okay. That's a sign. So, so, uh, <laughs> so, that, so that was good. So I ended up playing on uh, quite a few things. Um, cool. I got together with uh, uh, KG. Mm -hmm. um, again, this is all up in New, still in New Jersey. Right. And um, I got together with him about three or four times, and uh, he was saying you're going to be on a lot of different, not just the Naughty by Nature stuff, but uh, Easy E stuff, and a lot of other artists that I, to this day I don't even remember, because mm -hmm. honestly I wasn't really that interested. I was mm -hmm. just trying to pay my bills. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> You know what I'm saying, and um, so that was that was a great experience. And um, I also uh, played with a group uh, called uh, the New Jersey Mass Choir, hmm. and uh, Donnie Harper was the uh, choir director. Hmm. And um, I ended up getting that through a friend that I played right. in bands with. So all of the stuff is like word of mouth. I mean, now we have the internet and everything, but right. typically um, everything that, that I've done has just really been word of mouth mm -hmm. kind of thing. It's not like somebody says, hey, I saw you on the internet and yada, yada, yada. Yeah. You know, it's been, and um, so with, with, with Donnie Harper, did a couple of gigs with the New Jersey Mass Choir while still living up in New Jersey, and at some point decided to move to Atlanta. I knew mm -hmm. I wanted to live somewhere where the weather was warmer. <laughs> right. And um, so I knew I would not live in New Jersey for, mm -hmm. for the rest of my life. Right. <laughs> <laughs> So I moved to Atlanta again in 95 and I was 37 at the time and uh, I uh, which which is kind of a, a weird thing to just like kind of you know cut yourself off at the knees and like start all over somewhere right, else right. without having anything going mm -hmm. on right. um, which was you know I remember that it's been a long time but I remember that like it was yesterday because that was an interesting thing to just yeah, kind of drop everything and just go right you know right. but I did call a, a big leap of faith right <laughs> I did call different people because I had done like we talked about earlier all different kind of gigs I used mm -hmm. to play in a reformed Jewish temple I used to do oh. gigs like that uh, country gigs I mean mm -hmm. I've just done like a lot of different kind of gigs so I called up uh, Donnie Harper with the uh, uh, New Jersey Mass Choir. And I said, hey, do you know anyone in uh, Atlanta? I said, mm -hmm. because, you know, I just moved down here. He says, no. He says, but um, I, uh, I'm i doing this gig with Sissy Houston, mm -hmm. right, which is Whitney Houston's mother. Do you right. want to do it? And I said, sure. <laughs> you know, next thing I know, I'm flying up to New Jersey, <laughs> where I'm from. <laughs> right, and we ended up playing, uh, opening up for uh, Blood, Sweat, and Tears oh, yeah. at the, uh, the uh, Foxwood Casino. Nice up in Connecticut and uh, that was great uh, second uh, night was uh, uh, Sissy's birthday so Whitney was there and she came on stage and she sang and everything mm -hmm. and that was that was a real neat thing yeah that's to awesome. be able to yeah. to do that and um, yeah so just um, just a lot of there's the there's a other stuff easy for me to say there's other stuff <laughs> that um, I've done and some of the stuff I you know I've 
years go by and you don't quite remember. But another another gig that really sticks out in my mind is um, have a friend uh, who again was from New Jersey mm-hmm. and he was living out in Maui, so he came to New Jersey. Um, I guess this is like late '80s. He came to New Jersey and uh, he says, "Yeah, man, I'm here with this band." I said, "Oh, you're from Maui and you're touring New Jersey? Okay." <laughs> So any, <laughs> anyway, he says, why don't you come down to the gig? So I was living like a few blocks. I said, yeah, man, after, I'm, after I finished teaching, you know, mm-hmm. I gotta, I'll, come, I'll come to the gig and just sit in. He wanted me to sit in. So I get there, and it's just guitar, uh, keyboards, and drums. And I was like, man, I didn't know you hit, didn't have a bass player. I said, man, let me run home and get my amp. So I, mm-hmm. I ran home, got my amp, and uh, sat in and played. Mm-hmm. And this was like in August of uh, 89. Right. And in March of uh 1990 i'm getting the call hey man you want to come do this gig in italy wow. in sardinia for nine weeks wow okay <laughs> so uh there's a percussionist well-known percussionist called uh emil richards mm-hmm. in la if you hear the uh the original song to like the adams family oh yeah right, right. if you hear all the sound effects like at the end that's emil emil's per- right. uh percussionist right. you know i mean he's the he was the cat mm-hmm. as far as right. on i mean i can't even mention how many uh recordings tv shows commercials i mean you just look up his name and you can you know online and you can check out all the stuff he's right. done so i said man this is like a huge like opportunity to be right. able to do this gig so i did the gig and it was great we uh we were more jazz um the first month mm-hmm and the second month we were more playing more like R&B stuff. We had we had a vocalist there the whole time, and uh, the, and I recommended a friend of mine from New Jersey, mm-hmm. a keyboard player, and it was just uh, really um, just a great opportunity to be right. hanging out. I mean, imagine if you're doing a gig, and the only thing you have to worry about is what you're gonna eat. <laughs> and what you're gonna wear to the gig right. for the whole day. That's nice. all I had to be concerned with. And then wow. we just played from like ten to twelve. Nice. And that that was it. You know, and right, took a and took right. a break. Right. You know, in between that, that time period. Very so that cool. that was actually a great gig, great opportunity um to be able to play with uh, great musicians. Actually I've been real fortunate mm-hmm. um just as far as, you know, playing music full time this this long. Mm-hmm. Um it's been since uh, June of 1982 that I've been a full-time musician right, just just wow. teaching everything and um, I've always had the opportunity to play with just really yourself included great musicians yeah. and um, just uh, not really any boneheads <laughs> you know I've been real fortunate to, mm-hmm. to, to really play with good people and that right. was that was part of my my deal I, I said you know I just love to play mm-hmm. you know with great musicians and good people, and I've been right. real fortunate to be yeah. able to, to be able to do that all these years. You know, right. I can't. Nobody really sticks in my mind. It's like, oh man, I hated that gig. You know. <laughs> right. Well, that's a that's a real blessing to not have right. a lot of that kind of memory. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. And uh, years ago, it was it was a uh, the reason if I left the band, it was purely like a growth thing. Right, right. I felt like, especially when I was young. You know, I was in my twenties. It was like I got in bands and. Um, no matter what they thought of my plan, it's mm-hmm. like, you know what? <clears throat> I need to be better in this situation. I don't care if you're satisfied or not. I need to feel mm-hmm. that I am better in this situation. Once I got to the point where I really grew and, I, and it just kind of leveled out, mm-hmm. I was like, see ya. <laughs> 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 it wasn't really that cold, but it, it was one of those things where, you know, at some point it was just kind of time to move on anyway. Sure. And I felt mm-hmm. that I had grown in the situation and now it's time to to further you know right go somewhere else where you can grow some more exactly that that that's a that's a huge thing because otherwise you do just kind of uh fizzle out if if, if you're not growing okay so when you moved to atlanta how uh, did you actually get into the scene and get hooked up with things right um i had to do basically things that I didn't want to do, like go to jam <laughs> sessions. <laughs> right. I remember you, know, you telling me about doing a lot of that. Right. Mm-hmm. People would say, you know, well, you have to go to jam sessions, you have to sit in, and then there was a, I guess maybe it still exists, there was a paper called The Creative Loafing. Right. So I would look in there for different uh, situations, people looking for bass players. Right. And um, so I ended up going down to this place called the Red Light Cafe. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And uh, 
saw the band in there and actually talked to the keyboard player who mm -hmm. happened to be Randy Hex Hexter. <laughs> right. And uh, so I, I saw Randy a couple of times, talked to him, you know, explained I was new in town, yada, yada, yada. And um, so he was like, oh, man, you have to come to the Atlanta Institute of Music mm -hmm. and uh, meet Adam Nitty and uh, Jerry Peake. Mm -hmm. So I said, okay, cool, I'm going to do that, you know. So I came down to the Atlanta Institute of Music and um, got a chance to meet Adam. And Adam and I, we talked for about 40 minutes, mm -hmm. first time we met, you know, just talking about things. And he was asking me, he says, man, you know that, you know, like jazz stuff. And I said, yeah, I was a jazz performance major in college. And, and uh, so... Long story short, eventually I started subbing for Adam. He would call me and say, hey man, I don't want to do private lessons. Why, why don't you come to the school and do private lessons? Mm -hmm. So I was like, cool, great. Um, why don't you, he says, oh, I don't want to do the jazz performance classes this quarter or whatever. Why don't you come mm -hmm. and do the jazz performance classes? Right. So, so I did. And uh, eventually he said to me, he says, he says, I hope, you, I hope you don't mind. He says, but I'm actually working you into the school. And I said, I don't have a problem with that at all. Right, right. So, so at this point, it's been, um, I think, over 21 years that I'm, I'm well, still, yeah. still the Atlanta Institute of Music, right, right. still teaching there. So that's, that's been a good thing, right. you know, good thing for me. And, um, you know, as far as other gigs and opportunities, again, it was going to the jam sessions. Um, I, um, I got to a, to a point, since I live pretty far north of the city, mm -hmm. um, I stopped going out. I'm like, I'm not really making any money. I, I did start, I was fortunate enough to start working at a church just after being here for one month. I mm -hmm. ended up uh, playing at this church because I would, I would go see this. Uh, I thought I was going to see, like, a, I was going to different places to see the band playing. It always ended up right. being this band called Chronicles at the, <laughs> at the time. <laughs> <laughs> so there was a younger cat he was a drummer and we would see each other you know mm -hmm. these three times we saw each other and he asked me if I played bass you know you know, was a musician I told him I played bass yada yada I was new in town and I had played with the New Jersey Mass Choir like I mentioned earlier and um, he was like great so I ended up doing a church gig like you know after, yeah. after I was here just a, just a uh, just for a month right and uh, so the other thing was at some point I stopped going out to jam sessions, I'm like, look, I'm not really making that much money, and uh, it's costing me mm -hmm. to go out. But then I was like, okay, but if I'm sitting here, like in my house, no one knows that I can play, right? You know, so um, I decided to go out. Went out, met a bass player um, at this place called Cafe Two Ninety, mm -hmm. and um, so I would kind of go out, you know, and sit in. So so. Um, Bass player was saying, he says, hey, man, why don't you, why don't you come and uh, why don't you go up and sit? And I said, no, nah, that's OK. I'll kind of hang back here. You know, I said, mm -hmm. usually this cat comes up to me and asks me if I want to play. You know, right. so he started to tell me, he said, hey, man, Paul Mitchell is looking for somebody looking for a bass player. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure you're familiar with Dante's Down the Hatch. Right. And uh, that was one of the when I, I know when I first moved here, that was one of the better gigs in town. Right. And uh, I was playing straight ahead jazz six nights a week. Right. right. And um so uh, after I found out that was the case, um, I didn't even sit in that night. Once this bass player kind of left, <laughs> I, I scooted out. <laughs> I, was, I, was, I was like, hey, I know I'm going to be Tuesday night because they had Monday night off. Uh -huh. And I think the jam session was like Sunday. So I said, hey, Tuesday, I'm kind of I'm going to be there. So I had a good friend of mine up in the in uh, New Jersey, New York area. He says, mm -hmm. man, he says, man, wherever you go, man, just bring your bass, man, whether you're coming from playing doing a gig session just put your bass on your back that way people know that you play right, right. so i was like I'm definitely doing that so i went down to dante's down the hatch <laughs> on a tuesday night just coming from home but i had my bass on my back <laughs> <laughs> so i sat down at one of the tables close to where paul was and uh when they were done with the set he got off he says he says hey man uh he says i see you you play bass right i said yeah i play bass he says you new in town i said yep and he says, I'm looking for, I'm looking to make a change, you know, in the bass chair. And I was thinking, hmm, I, <laughs> I thought you might be, <laughs> you know. So uh, I actually subbed, uh, Ronnie Harville was actually the mm -hmm. bass player who, who, um, who I spoke to and told me that, you know, Paul was looking to make a change. Mm -hmm. And uh, so at some point, Ronnie was just, he told me he was just filling in until Paul found someone. Right. So I would sub for uh, Ronnie, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, at some point, I was like, "Right, man, you gotta, you gotta leave, man. <laughs> I need this gig. You gotta, you gotta go. You just gotta, <laughs> you know." So at some point, uh, Roddy did leave, and at that mm -hmm. at that point, that's when Paul asked me, 
you know, could I actually do this? Did I want to do the gig? Right. And I was like, sure, I want to do it, yeah. you know. And that gig probably really put me on the map in Atlanta. Nice. And the reason I'm thinking that is because to do that gig, you had to read, mm -hmm. right? Because he, he, he had a book or I used the real book, you know, right. to play tunes. But I'm pretty sure he had a book. Mm -hmm. And um, so you had to read. You had to consistently show up on time, <laughs> right? Right, and because you know, the gig was six nights a yeah. week, so mm -hmm. you had to be there. It's a job. And uh, also, you had to solo. It's mm -hmm. just a, it was just piano uh, trio, right? So you know, he's not going to just solo the whole night, and there's no bass mm -hmm. solo, you right? Know? Right. Um, I've noticed over the years a lot of guys when it's just a piano trio. At some point, they're tired of solo in every song, right? You know. Mm -hmm. So um, I got a lot of opportunity to. Uh, to play solos, right. you know, which I actually did nice. in New Jersey as well. Mm -hmm. And um, again, sometimes the student, the students will ask me, you know, man, how do you get to solo like that? I said, you know, practicing is great and learning mm -hmm. all of this stuff, but really, you need to be given the opportunity. Right. Mm -hmm. So I was fortunate enough to have that opportunity pretty often. A real and, gig that right, provides and, that. Exactly, mm -hmm. especially this gig playing six nights a week. Right. Yeah. And I did that gig for about a year. Right. And um, and then I left, mm -hmm. you know, and um, so so that was really like I said, in order to have done that gig, the word probably got out. Hey, this guy can read. Mm -hmm. He can play the jazz stuff. He can improv, you right. know, and he's showing up on time. And to my face, nobody told me I was a jerk. So I'm thinking <laughs> right. I'm thinking I'm thinking I probably wasn't a jerk. Right. So, right. right. At least I had a fold. <laughs> right. Exactly. So. uh Yes, yeah, so um, after I left there, I started working with, with different people. Still, it's one of those things where um, you always have to kind of network and yeah. spread the word, you know. Right. Well, and, it sounds uh, like it's also a good example of, uh, of having uh, an opportunity really because you kept helping the opportunity come to fruition. It, it didn't just magically happen. I right. I mean, it was, it was a, a blessing that it happened, but it was... but you had to get out there and put yourself in position each at each turn to make it happen. So I think that's a really good point that, right. that people should should realize too about getting getting the gig that they want, you know. Right. It's, uh it is it's it does always come back down to just actually even being in the right place and and it's not just luck a lot of times. It's it's you have to have some intention behind it. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay, so tell me a little bit more about uh, what's going on with you at the Atlanta Institute of Music and Media and, uh, and what, what your current gigs are like around Atlanta. Right. Um, the Atlanta Institute of Music has uh, been a great, uh, it's been great to be there all of these years, you know, mm -hmm. and, and helping students out is like a huge thing. Right. And, um, you know, part of it, my whole thing as far as teaching is try to help students go in the direction they want to go. Right. Not necessarily, you know, shove a lot of stuff down their throats. I mean, mm -hmm. some of the stuff, I mean, that's what the school is about. Any, uh, you know, educational system, I mean, there's things that you just have to learn. You know, right. like when I was in college, you know, you have to learn scales whether you want, whether you want to learn them or not. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> you know, you should learn reading. Right. You know, like when I was in college, my teacher told me, he says, look at, look at reading is like putting money in the bank. Mm, yeah, you know, at some point, point you, at some point you're going to need it. Right. You know, you, right. Might, you might not, you might not need it right now, but at some point you're going to need it. And I was expressed to them. If you see any of the like late night shows, we have bands. Mm -hmm. Those guys are on there. They can read. Right. You know, people Absolutely. who can't read are not getting those kind of gigs. Right. You know, cause you don't never know who you're backing up. And right. you know, if you don't know the material, if you have a chart, then you, then you can read the and chart. There's a constant influx of new material. Right. Yeah. Right. So, um, yeah, the thing about, again, about the Atlanta Institute of Music, they get a chance to perform, mm -hmm. you know, a few times a week in different classes. Right. And uh, that's one thing. And I didn't realize all these years, there's a lot of students who do have serious, like, stage fright, you know. Right. And some of the other instructors tried to turn me on to that. Like, man, some of these kids are, like, like really nervous. And I was like, really? Mm -hmm. And uh, at some point... I would look at their hands and their hands are just like shaking. Right. You know. Right. So um which is understandable if you you're not not comfortable getting in front of people right. and and doing that whole thing, but that is um something you have to get used to. Yeah. You have to learn mm -hmm. how not to choke. 
Right. And because uh, if you're auditioning for different bands, mm -hmm. they, they're not going to give you like five, six chances right. because the first three times you were nervous. Right. So, so it gives them the opportunity to right. try. And to... there's no way around it. It's just you got to go through it. And, right. And it seems like if you realize that you're going to live through it enough times, then you start being able to handle it better. Even if you have butterflies, you can still function on your high level. Right. Um, I, I kind of got that out of the way early mm -hmm. when I played accordion. Right. I, was, I was 10 and they said, we have a recital. And I'm like, you have a what? I have to do what in front of people? What? Are you crazy? <laughs> so a uh, good thing, uh, my whole thing of being paranoid about stuff is, is that I really practiced a lot mm -hmm. to get the piece that I had to play right. down. And I already had a mindset that like, if I screw up, I'm going to keep going. Right. Because standing there without playing, at least I could hide behind the music. You know, standing there and not playing was going to be more terrifying than if I made a mistake. Absolutely. So that's what I did. I, I, I did make a mistake. I don't know if people really knew it or not. Mm -hmm. And because uh, I just kept going. Right. Anyway, so right. that so that is an op a good opportunity, uh, like you said, for the students to, mm -hmm. to, to get that because they have to go through it. Right. Any, any way to have to go through right. that that whole process um, so it, it really is a good opportunity and um, it's kind of neat how um, I teach quite a few classes there mm. so I kind of know what's going on like okay I know you're getting this I know you're getting this and I know how it's being taught because I'm the one doing it mm -hmm, you right. know so, so that is that is that has been a very good thing right um, to be able to kind of monitor their 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 progress and everything. Mm -hmm. And the school is really trying to get on, um, well, it is online mm -hmm. now. They're really um, pushing that whole thing. And that's just right. the way, you know, technology just has a way of just creeping in whether you want it to or not. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. And, uh, you know, uh, certain things we just, with with everything, we, we, we learn how to adapt to certain right. things, things that are different. And uh, some of the students uh, who have been, especially within the last year, who are at the school, they're like, man, I'm not going to do that online thing. Man, I've mm -hmm. got to be sitting there with the teacher. Mm -hmm. So I think some of that is still going to be, um, it's good, well, it's good for the teachers, it's good for us, mm -hmm. that people still want to be in your face and the, right, the Skype right. thing, you know, you're going to have, everybody learns differently and has a different mm -hmm. way of, uh, you know, some people are good with the online Skype thing. Mm -hmm. Some people are good with just getting a book and learning out of a book, mm -hmm. you know, and there's also videos and stuff people can just watch. Right. And uh, so fortunately there are still enough people who want that face to face thing, right. you know, of learning mm -hmm. and um, which, which I prefer. Right. Anyway, right. because because that way, um, you know. Well, there's an experience component that you don't really get otherwise. So yeah, as a student. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. That kind of that kind of being in the moment thing mm -hmm. too. Right. You know. Right. So uh, yeah. So some of the gigs that um, that I've uh, maintained here for quite some time in Atlanta is obviously being an aim. Also, um, I've been working with the Mose Davis Trio. Mm -hmm. Um, I guess it's been, whew, it's probably been 19 years. Wow. I think I've been with him. And we're down, uh, the most steady gig that I've done with him has been down at the Peace Street Plaza Hotel. Right. Up in the Sundial mm -hmm. Bar and Restaurant on the uh, 73rd floor. Wow, yeah. And uh, we're just, we're, again, we're just a trio, so it's not five people. <laughs> right. Someone asked me that time, oh, you guys are a trio? So how many people are in the band? Five? <laughs> I mean, he was, obviously he was just joking. I think that happened earlier this year. And uh, so, um, again, we do, I've, was talking about Rocky Top before, mm -hmm. I've, we've played Rocky Top. I played, you know, <laughs> right. he, he was like, oh, you, you need to follow me on, on this one. I was like, dude, I played this one like a good 30 years ago. Right, you know? right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so Rocky, anything from Rocky Top to uh, uh, Cold Train, Herbie mm -hmm. Hancock. Uh, the Eurythmics, <laughs> right. uh, the Police, Cameo, right, Alicia wow. Keys. I mean, that gig, we do everything right, on that right. gig. Um, so it, it's, it's definitely not, a, it's, how could it be a boring gig? I mean, yeah. you're playing all these different yeah. styles of music. Right. That was years ago, we used to do uh, like Valentine's Day, and I think we also did, I'm not sure whether it was Mother's Day, some big important holiday. Mm -hmm. 
where they had us play from 12 o'clock in the afternoon to 10 o'clock that night. Wow. 45 minutes on, 15 minutes off the whole time. Wow. After the last set, I didn't know where to go. <laughs> I was so used to going back to the bandstand. <laughs> yeah, you have like, been programmed at that point. Right. And uh, we never repeated a song. Wow. And wow. probably That's a lot of songs. That's a lot of songs, right. And because since we draw from so many different genres, mm. it's, it's kind of like endless yeah. W- what we can do and it also Amazing. makes it hard uh, for people who if you only play funk or you only play rock or you only play jazz to come in and sub on that gig right. is not the easiest thing to do right. because we're playing whatever bosses I mean uh, you know Bessame Mucha I mean we play all right. of this, all these different styles if you're any kind of snob with any kind of music that's not the, the gig to <laughs> sub on which <laughs> is probably going to be something that you don't want to play right you right. know but again my thing was always from the beginning if it's with mus- really good musicians on the gig then it is uh how could the music be I uh, music be horrible. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's going right. to be good. Right. You, know, you might not right. like certain songs. I've right. got songs that I don't really care to play right. more than other songs, but still, sure. you know, it's uh, that's what I'm asked to do. So yeah. I'm, 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 you know, I'm providing a service. We're right, right, right. right. If we're if we're if we're self-employed musicians, and we're who, providing a service. Who you're playing with makes a big difference in that experience. I've for me anyway. Right. I've always noticed that that if I'm I can play almost anything with somebody that I like to play music with, but but I don't even want to play stuff I like with people I don't like to play with. You know? Right, so, exactly. <laughs> it makes a big difference. Absolutely. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. So some of the other some of the other uh, people that I work with, I work with a uh, Tom Woods piano player, and I'm working with Tom now. It's got to be getting close to 15 years, wow. and we've we've played uh, different different hotels mm-hmm. as well. And uh, that that's actually a great gig. One of the again, one of the current gigs that I'm doing, where the trio stays the same, mm-hmm. and then we'll have a different singer fronting the band, right? Or or instrumentalist fronting mm-hmm. the band. So that's that's neat. So even though it is every other week and we're at the same spot, the gig is like slightly different every mm-hmm. time we play right. because we're playing different materials and different uh, uh, instrumentalists or, or vocalists, and obviously that brings like a different energy. So right, so, right. so that's kind of a cool thing. Nice. So pretty fortunate to uh, to do some of these gigs where ba- basically my my Sunday through Saturday is different if I'm working all of those days and. Mm-hmm. and and typically, I've been fortunate who for the past, I don't know, man, 15 years or so mm-hmm. that my schedule has been Sunday through Thursday steady. Wow. Then if I'm getting called for Friday and Saturday, I'm in the six days working or uh, seven days a week wow. working, you know. Wow. So I've been real fortunate since I've been down here. So, I'm, nice. you know. I'm not ready for that to stop, so hopefully that's yeah. going to con- continue. <laughs> I'm sure it will. I'm sure it will. Well, Gary, I really appreciate you talking to me and uh, sharing your story and sharing oh, sure. all these things yeah. thanks, that uh, thanks you've been for, Thanks for asking me. Appreciate it's, that. It's, uh, it's, it's my honor, and uh, I, I'm sure I'm going to be talking to you again soon. Right, no doubt. I appreciate it. Okay, thanks, man. <laughs> Okay, I hope you enjoyed hanging out with Gary as much as I did. If you want to find out some more about Gary and listen to some more stuff of his, uh, you can check him out on his YouTube channel. Uh, It's Bass Zen Master. And uh, as always, if you like this video and like to see any more of this kind of stuff, please click like and subscribe. And also, if there's anybody on the Atlanta scene that you know of that you'd like for me to try to interview that you think I could have a chance of uh, getting a hold of, uh, just let me know in the comments. And uh, as always, I appreciate you checking it out, and I hope to see you soon. (laughs) 